Hey, this is Presh Tollwalker. In the due course of mathematical history, mathematicians eventually came across equations like x squared is equal to negative 1. In order to give an answer, they invented a new number, i, such that i squared is equal to negative 1, or i is equal to the square root of negative 1. Now, mathematicians are never content just to have a new toy. They want to play with it and experiment. So eventually they wondered, what is i to the power of i equal to? If we input this into Wolfram Alpha, we get the interesting result that we have a real answer. It's equal to e to the power of negative pi over 2, which is approximately equal to 0 0.208. In fact, if you look a little closer, it could be a multi-valued result. So why exactly does this happen? How is an imaginary number to an imaginary power equal to a real number? And what are all these other values? So I looked on YouTube, and I will say that in the English videos I found on YouTube, unfortunately, all of the popular ones I've seen are wrong. They have at least one unjustified step. Now, they do give the correct answer, but it is getting the right answer with the wrong method. So let me just show you some examples. Let's say you need to simplify these fractions. Well, 16 divided by 64, we'll just cancel out the digit 6 and we get 1 over 4. 26 over 65, we'll cross out the 6s and get 2 over 5. 1, 6 is 3 over 3, 26. We can cancel out these digits and we get the answer of 1 half. You get the idea. If we just cancel out the digits in these fractions, we're going to get the right answer, but it is clearly the wrong method. It doesn't work in general, but for these cases, it does give you the right answer. Everybody would object to using this method, even though you do get the right answer. It is with the wrong method. So in order to understand this a little better, we go to the complex plane and say a complex number, z is equal to a plus bi. We can also write this in polar form, r multiplied by e to the i theta. So if we have a complex number z here, we can imagine a circle with a radius equal to r, and we have this angle theta. But of course, this is not a unique angle, we can add 2 pi to this angle, or any multiple of 2 pi, and we'll end up at exactly the same spot. So this number can also be written as r multiplied by e to the power of i multiplied by the angle theta plus 2 pi k. This is for k being an integer. Now, let's say that we have the number i. So r will be equal to 1, and the angle theta will be equal to pi over 2, or any 2 pi multiple of it. So i is equal to e to the power of i multiplied by pi over 2 plus 2 pi k. So for convenience sake, we will just take the principal value where we have k is equal to 0, and we get that i is equal to e to the power of i pi over 2. So here's a supposed proof of why i to the power of i is equal to e to the negative pi over 2. You start out with i is equal to e to the i pi over 2. You raise both sides to the power of i. Now on the right hand side, we have e to the i pi over 2 raised to some power. So you use the rule that a to the power of b, the term raised to the power of c, is equal to a to the power of bc. We multiply these exponents. So we get i to the power of i is equal to e to the power of i multiplied by i pi over 2. i multiplied by i is equal to negative 1. So we get i to the power of i is equal to e to the power of negative pi over 2. So we get the right answer. But in fact, between steps 2 and 3, this is a wrong step. This step is actually not justified in the terms of complex powers. And I'm going to explain why this is the case. So in general, this rule, a to the power of b raised to the power of c is equal to a to the power of bc, it's usually not shown with all of the conditions, but it should be some conditions like a is a positive real number and b and c are real numbers. There are other cases in which it could work, but here's just one of the standard ways in which it does work. It may not in general work if you have 
one of the numbers like C being a complex number. So what would the number one be in terms of our complex numbers? So we have a radius that's equal to one and we have an angle that's equal to two pi. It could also be zero, but let's just take two pi. So we could write one as equal to e to the power of two pi i. What would negative one be? One way to represent it, we have a radius of one and we have an angle that's equal to pi. So negative one is equal to e to the power of pi i. So the number one is of course equal to one to the power of one half. But one is equal to e to the two pi i, so we substitute in for one. So now we have e to the two pi i being raised to the power of one half. Now what happens if we apply this rule of multiplying the exponents? We get that this is equal to e to the power of two pi i multiplied by one half, which simplifies to be e to the power of pi i. But e to the power of pi i is equal to negative one. So we have shown that one is equal to negative one. So this is the pitfall of just multiplying these exponents. You can end up with an absurd result. This is why it is not a justified step in general. So now here's a proof I've also seen. So complex exponentiation can be defined as z to the power of w is equal to e to the power of w times the natural log of z. So i to the power of i is equal to e to the power of i multiplied by the natural log of i. But then i we've shown is equal to e to the i pi over two. So we can substitute in for i. Then we have the natural log of e to the x is equal to x. So this cancels out. So we have e to the power of i multiplied by i pi over two. i times i is equal to negative one. So we get i to the power of i is equal to e to the power of negative pi over two. So we got the right answer. But once again, we've used an unjustified step. Between two and three, this is actually wrong in general for complex numbers. So I'm going to explain why this is the case. So let's take this rule. The natural log of e to the power of x is equal to x. This is true for real numbers, but this identity may not always hold when x is a complex number. So let's see what can go wrong. We've shown that one is equal to e to the power of two i pi. Take the natural log of both sides. The natural log of one is equal to zero. And then if we apply the rule on the right hand side, we get this is equal to two i pi. So we've shown that zero is equal to two i pi, which is wrong. So between the second and third steps here, we can see we can't use the rule that the natural log of e to the power of x is equal to x. That's an unjustified step. So how are we supposed to calculate i to the power of i with a more careful analysis. So in order to do that, let's look at z to the power of w. How do we even define complex exponentiation? The trick is to rely on the power series definition of e to the power of z. This converges for all complex numbers z. It also has the nice property that e to the power of u plus v is equal to e to the power of u multiplied by e to the power of v for all complex numbers u and v. We can then define z to the power of w as e to the power of w multiplied by the natural logarithm of z. But now we have another problem. We need to define what the complex logarithm of z is equal to. So what is the complex logarithm of z? So let's say we have an equation z is equal to e to the power of w. If we solve for w, that would be our value for the natural log of z. So the natural log of z will be equal to w. So how can we do that? Well, let's represent z in terms of polar form. So we pull up this diagram once again. Now we're going to write it in another way. So the radius of the circle is exactly equal to the absolute value of z, or the modulus or the norm of z. We can say that the angle theta plus two pi k is equal to the argument of z. So we can rewrite this 
as the absolute value of z multiplied by e to the power of i multiplied by the argument of z. So we have another form of the complex number z. So we say that this form is equal to e to the power of w. Now w is a complex number which we will write as u plus vi. u and v are real numbers. So we can split this up as e to the power of u multiplied by e to the power of vi. Now u and v are real numbers. So this equation implies that the absolute value of z is equal to e to the power of u and the argument of z is equal to v. Since the absolute value of z and e to the power of u are real numbers, we can now just apply the regular logarithm that we always know to both sides of the equation. We can then bring down the exponent because u is a real number. So the ordinary natural logarithm of the absolute value of z is equal to the real number u. Here we need another type of notation that we use a capital letter ln of x, and this will be the ordinary real natural logarithm. So we can put this all together to come up with a sensible definition for the complex logarithm. We wanted to solve the equation z is equal to e to the power of w, and w would be equal to the complex logarithm of z. So the complex logarithm of z is equal to w is equal to u plus iv. We showed that in this case, u would have to be equal to the ordinary natural logarithm of the absolute value of z, and v would have to be the argument of z. So the definition is the complex logarithm of z is equal to the ordinary natural logarithm of the absolute value of z plus i times argument of z. This is a multi-valued result because the argument of z can be incremented by two pi multiples. If we wanted a single value result, which is often useful, this is what we do when we deal with functions. We want to look whether they're continuous. We can calculate their derivatives. We take the principal value, the complex logarithm of z, is equal to the ordinary natural logarithm of the absolute value of z plus i times arg z, but here we limit the argument of z to be between negative pi is less than the argument of z is less than or equal to pi. So with this definition, we can proceed. So now we will solve i to the power of i. So we start out with the definition of complex exponentiation. z to the power of w is equal to e to the power of w the complex logarithm of z. So i to the power of i is equal to e to the power of i multiplied by the complex logarithm of i. So we need to evaluate the complex logarithm of i. So the complex logarithm of i will be equal to the ordinary natural logarithm of the absolute value of i plus i times the argument of i. Recalling that i is equal to e to the power of i multiplied by pi over 2 plus 2 pi k, for k being an integer, we can see that the absolute value of i will be equal to 1. So we substitute that in. And then the argument of i will be equal to pi over 2 plus 2 pi k. So the complex logarithm of i is equal to the ordinary natural logarithm of 1 plus i times pi over 2 plus 2 pi k. The ordinary logarithm of 1 is equal to 0. So the natural logarithm of i is equal to i multiplied by pi over 2 plus 2 pi k. We substitute that into our formula. We now have i multiplied by i, which is equal to i squared. i squared is equal to negative 1. And this is exactly the result we want. This is the multi-valued result. It's equal to e to the power of negative pi over 2 plus 2 pi k for k being an integer. These will all be real values for any integer value of k. Furthermore, if we limit to the principal value, k is equal to 0, we get i to the power of i is equal to e to the power of negative pi over 2, which is approximately equal to 0 0.208. And that's the right way to calculate i to the power of i. It does involve a lot of careful analysis, but in the end, this is very important so that we don't break all the rules of mathematics and get ridiculous results like 1 is equal to negative 1. Thanks for making us one of the best communities on YouTube. 
See you next episode of Mind Your Decisions, where we solve the world's problems one video at a time.